गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन टॉपिक फॉर टूडेज प्रेजेंटेशन इज सोमैटिक मोटर पाथवेज कंपिटेंसी नंबर इज ए एन फिफ्टी सेवन पॉइंट फोर ऑब्जेक्टिव ऑफ टूडेज लेक्चर यू हैव टू सी द डिटेल्स ऑफ द पिरामिडल सिस्टम द एक्स्ट्रा पिरामिडल सिस्टम एंड द अप्लाइड एस्पेक्ट ऑफ वे Now the somatic motor pathways of the brain and the spinal cord. This is divided into two system. This is the pyramidal system and the extra pyramidal system. The pyramidal system and the extra pyramidal they control the motor activities of the body through the lower motor neurons. Pyramidal system it directly controls the lower motor neurons while the extra pyramidal it indirectly with the tortuous course controls the activity. Now this both pyramidal as well as extra pyramidal they go hand in hand to control the movement. Pyramidal system, it is the main voluntary motor pathway. It consists of two neurons, the upper motor neurons and the lower motor neurons. The upper motor neurons they extend from the cortex up till that of the motor nuclei of the brainstem. These are the corticonuclear fibers. Right from the cortex. till the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord these are the corticospinal fibers while the lower motor neurons they extend from that of the cranial nerve nuclei and from the anterior horn cells to the skeletal muscles the pyramidal tract it concerned with the skillful voluntary movements as it occupies the pyramid of the medulla the corticospinal fibers are also known as a pyramidal tract now this pyramidal tract it consists it includes the corticospinal plus the corticonuclear fiber the corticospinal fibers these are arising predominantly from the area number 4 they also arise from the area number 6a as well as area number 3 2 while some fibers of it they also arise from the temporal as well as the occipital lobe so whatever the corticospinal fibers these are arising from all over of the neo cortex now they passes through the corona radiata then the posterior limb of the internal capsule then at the level of the midbrain they passes through the middle to fifth part of the midbrain that is the crus cerebri then at the level of the pons the fibers they dispersed because of the ponto cerebellar fibers and the pontine bundles of the pontine nuclei then in the upper medulla they form a swelling that is known as a pyramid so name of this fibers given as a pyramidal tract now in the lower medulla 75% of the fibers they cross to the opposite side and they descend downwards in the spinal cord in the lateral funiculus of the spinal cord as the lateral corticospinal tract while the 20% of the fibers they are uncrossed they descend downwards and they form a anterior corticospinal tract now the remaining 5% fibers they passes through the lateral corticospinal tract of the same side this anterior corticospinal tract it goes up till the appropriate level of the spinal cord and it crosses to the opposite side so the anterior corticospinal tract they cross to the opposite side at the appropriate level of the spinal cord so whatever that corticospinal fibers they control the opposite half of the cerebral cortex 
if the lesion is below the pyramidal decussation, that will affect the opposite side of the body. Now, what will be the somatotopic presentation at different levels? In the precentral gyrus, it is represented as upside down presentation, that is the inverted motor homunculus. Head is lower down, followed by the neck, upper limb, and the lower limb, while the representation beyond the knee and the perineal region that is lying onto the medial surface of the cerebral hemisphere. Now lower down as the fibers they are passing through the internal capsule. They take a 90 degree turn. So head is lying head to lower upper limb, lower limb. They are lying anterior to posterior. While in the crust cerebri, the head fibers for the head region they are most medial, while the lower limb fiber these are most posterior. In the de decussation, upper limb fibers they decussate at a higher level, while the lower limb fibers they are at a lower level. Now at different levels of the spinal cord, the cervical fibers they are lying most medial, followed by the thoracic, lumbar, and the sacral fibers. Now the corticonuclear fibers they arise and they lie along the corticospinal fiber. Now in the internal capsule they occupy the genu of the internal capsule. Now in the midbrain they form lies medial to that of the corticospinal fiber and at different levels of the brainstem they cross to the opposite side and synapse with the cells of the cranial nerve nuclei. The cranial nerve nuclei that supplies the muscles, now these are functionally equivalent to the anti-horn cells of the spinal cord. So this is for the corticonuclear fiber. Now moving on to the extrapyramidal system. This is a older system than that of the pyramidal and it consists of all the tracts other than that of the pyramidal tracts. So in this flow chart we can see how the corpus triatum it controls the spinal cord through the different pathways like the rubrospinal vestibulospinal, olivospinal, reticulospinal tracts. So we are going to see the different tracts of the extrapyramidal system. The rubrospinal tract, it is lying just anterior to that in the lateral funicular, just anterior to that of the lateral corticospinal tract. So this is the rubrospinal tract. Now as you can see in the figure, it is a crossed tract arising from the red nucleus then it descends downwards. It decussates immediately as you can see in the figure and then it descends towards the other side. The fibers as usual corticospinal they ends into the lamina 5 to 7 of the spinal cord and they influence the low motor neurons through the alpha and the gamma motor neurons. Now this rubrospinal tract, it is facilitatory to the flexors and it is inhibitory to the extensors. This red nucleus, it also receives fibers from the cerebral cortex. So this will be the corticorubral fibers. Now it also receives the red nucleus afferents from that of the cerebellum and the globus pallidus. So, it, it is facilitatory to the flexors and it is inhibitory to the extension. Now, this all descending tracts, the rubrospinal, tectospinal, vestibulospinal, olivospinal, 
other than that of the corticospinal. These are known as the extrapyramidal motor system. The corticospinal tract, they control the precise movements of the distal musculature. While this extrapyramidal, they control the gross postural movements. Moving on to the tectospinal tracts, it is lying in between that of the vestibular spinal and the anterior corticospinal tracts by the side of the anterior median fissure. Now this is arising from the superior colliculus. It crosses to the opposite side and extends downwards. Now this is point to note here is it extends up till the cervical region. As this tract is confined to the cervical segments, it forms a part of the reflex pathway for turning the head in response to the hearing, visual and the other exteroceptive stimuli. Now the reticulospinal tracts, these are the medial and the lateral reticulospinal tract. So this is the lateral reticulospinal and this is the medial reticulospinal. Now these extend throughout, these are poorly localized and they extend throughout the length of the spinal cord. Now the medial reticulospinal tract, this is lying by the side of the anterior medial fissure. That, so here you can see the medial reticulospinal tract. Now in this figure it is shown by the red pathway. It is arising from the medial part of the pontine reticular formation and it descends mostly uncrossed as you can see in the figure and terminates in the laminae 7 to 8 of the spinal gray. Now through interneurons it influences that of the alpha and the gamma neuron. Now this Medial reticulospinal arising from the pontine reticular formation, it is facilitatory to the extensor while it is inhibitory to the flexors. The lateral reticulospinal tract, as you can see in the figure by the black pathway, now this is a line just medial to that of the lateral corticospinal and the rubrospinal tract. So this is the medullary or the lateral reticulospinal tract. Now as it is suggested as the medullary, it is arising from the medulla. It descends in the lateral funicular. Now here it is lying medial to that of the lateral corticospinal and the rubrospinal tracts. And they ends into lamina 7 to 8 of the spinal cord. These are inhibitory to the extensors while it is facilitatory to the flexor, just opposite to that of the medial reticulospinal, which is facilitatory to extensors and inhibitory to the flexor. Now, this reticular formation. Now this receives mainly input from the motor cortex to that of the corticoreticular fibers as it is extending throughout the spinal cord. So the corticoreticulospinal tracts, they also form an additional pathway from motor cortex to spinal cord and it is also important component of the extrapyramidal system. Now moving on to the vestibular spinal tract, this consists of two pathways. These are the lateral vestibular spinal and the medial vestibular spinal tract. As the name suggests, vestibular spinal, they are arising from the vestibular nuclear complex, which is lying in the upper medulla. And four group of nuclei are lying here. These are the medial nucleus, 
superior nucleus, dental nucleus, and the inferior nucleus. Inferior nucleus is not seen in the figure. Now, from where they are receiving the afferents? The vestibular nuclear complex it receives the afferent from the vestibular nerve and from the flocculonuclear nodular lobe of the cerebellum. Now, from where the sensations are received by this vestibular nerve? Through the receptors of the maculae of the sacral and the article and the rotary receptors of the ampullary crest of the semicircular ducts. Now, where the efferents of this go? The efferents are going into three directions. First to the archicerebellum, then to the cranial nerve nuclei of the third, fourth and sixth cranial nerves via the medial longitudinal fasciculus and to the low motor neurons of the spinal anterior brain column through that of the vestibular spinal to maintain the equilibrium and the posture of the body and the limbs. So moving to the lateral vestibular spinal. Now this is lying, the lateral vestibular spinal tract is lying in the anterior funicular in between that of the tectospinal and the olivospinal tract. It extends throughout the spinal cord and it is a uncrossed one. It arises from the lateral vestibular nucleus. Superficial fibers of it terminate in the cervical enlargement while the deep burn the action up till the lumbosacral enlargement of the cord. The terminal fibers they terminate into laminae 7 to 8 of the spinal cord and to interneurons they extend up till that of the lamina 9. Now functionally this lateral vestibular spinal tract, which is shown here by the green color, it is facilitatory to extensors while it is inhibitory to the flexors. Now, the medial vestibular spinal tract, shown here by the red color, it is arising from the medial vestibular nucleus and it descends in the anterior and it descends in the anterior funiculus of the cord to that of the medial longitudinal fasciculus and you can see in the figure it is extending up till the mid thoracic level now this tract it runs by the side of the anterior medial sulcus and it is lying just lateral to that of the anterior corticospinal tract. The most of the fibers of this tract, these are the uncrossed one, while some fibers are crossed. Now this fiber, they reach the laminae 7 to 8 of the spinal cord. And finally they are projected to the laminae 9 to that of the interneurons. So this is about the medial vestibular spinal tract. They extend up till the mid thoracic level. The olivospinal tract, it is lying in between that of the lateral vestibular spinal and the anterior spinocerebellar tracts. Now this is extending from that of the inferior olivular nucleus and it descends ipsilaterally to that of the anterior gray column. There is uncertainty about the origin as well as the function of this olivospinal tract. Moving on to the monoaminergic spinal pathways, these are descending non adrenergic and adrenergic fiber. These are poorly localized and they descend in the anterior lateral funiculus with that of the corticospinal and the reticulospinal tracts. Now these fibers they carry the information from hypothalamus and the brainstem nuclei 
to that of the preganglionic autonomic neurons of the spinal grid column. Now moving on to the difference between the pyramidal and the extrapyramidal system. Phylogenetically, the pyramidal system is a recent one, while the extrapyramidal is older than that of the pyramidal system. Now, the pyramidal system it is responsible for the non-postural precise movements of the small muscles, while the extrapyramidal system it is responsible for the gross postural movement involving the large group of the muscles. Now this pyramidal system it is directly connected to the lower motor neurons while the extra pyramidal it is indirectly connected to the lower motor neurons through that of the polysynaptic pathways. Now what will be the effects of lesion? In case of pyramidal system there is no increase in the muscle tone while it is increased in case of the extra pyramidal system. The cortical fibers of the pyramidal they mainly arise from the primary motor area number 4 while in case of the extra pyramidal they arise from the premotor area area number 6. The subcortical centers and the basal ganglia they play no role in case of pyramidal system while they are having an important role in case of the extra pyramidal system. Now moving on to the applied anatomy of the motor pathways. Now the motor pathways, they consist of the upper motor neurons and the lower motor neurons. Now this upper motor neurons, they have their cell bodies in the area number 4 mainly. Now it is descending downwards. Through that of the internal capsule, then the middle two fifth part of the crust cerebri, then the basilar part of the pons and the medulla, and in the medulla they form a pyramid. Now about ninety percent fibers they cross to the opposite side, while ten percent fibers they are uncrossed one. So here you can see the crossing in the medulla, the left lateral, lateral corticospinal tracts and the anterior corticospinal tracts which are uncrossed one. Now this upper motor neurons, they synapse with the anti-horn cells of the opposite side. The low motor neurons they begin as the cell bodies of the anti horn cells and pass out in the anti roots of the spinal nerve to supply the skeletal muscles. Now, what will be the effect of the lesions of the upper motor neuron above the decussation of the pyramid? This will affect the opposite half of the body, while if the lesion is below the decussation, it will affect the same side of the now the characteristic features of this UMN region. Here the muscles are not paralyzed but they become weak and control over them is lost as the upper motor neurons these are affected. So elements these are released whatever the low motor neurons these are released from the control of that upper motor neurons. So Hyperactivity is seen, muscle twitching and the exaggerated tender reflexes are seen. The upper motor neurons, they don't innervate the muscles directly. So, muscle tone and the, is not lost and there is no wasting of the muscles seen. Now the cell body, lesions of the element, cell bodies of it lie in the cranial nerve nuclei which is lying in the brainstem and the anti-horns of the spinal cord.
so these will be the cell bodies of it while their neurons they pass out through that of the cranial nerve and through the anterior roots of the spinal nerves respectively so the neurons they are passing through that of the intranuclear course of the cranial nerve and through the anterior root of the spinal nerves now what will be the effect if the lesion is at this level lmn level so paralysis of the affected muscles the muscles become weak and flaccid there is a resting of muscle contracture of the muscle you see the tendon reflexes these are absent they either involve the nerve cell bodies or the nerve fibers arising from them and it is mostly seen in case of the polio and the pels palsy moving on to the difference between the upper motor neuron and the lower motor neuron lesions in case of the upper motor neuron there is paralysis of the group of muscles of one or more limbs can occur while in case of the element region individual muscles are paralyzed in umn lesion widespread paralysis is seen while in case of the element region the paralysis is localized the muscle tone becomes spastic while in case of the element region it is flaccid the deep tendon reflexes they are exaggerated in case of human region while they are absent in the element region the superficial reflexes like the abdominal and the cremation they are absent in both human as well as the element region the plantar response that is the babinski sign is positive in case of human region while there is no response in case of the element region the muscle atrophy it may not be that marked in case of human lesion while it is severe and early in case of element lesion the fasciculations and the fibrillations these are common in case of element lesion while they don't occur in case of human lesion the muscle clonus is present in case of human while they are it is absent in element lesion first we'll see what is the babinski sign now this is a clinical sign when there is scratching of the skin along the lateral aspect of the sole of the foot that will lead to the dorsiflexion of the great toe and fanning out of fingers of the other so here dorsiflexion of the great toe occurs and fanning out of the fingers occur this is considered as a positive babinski sign while in case of the normal person when there is scratching of the lateral aspect of the sole of the foot that will lead to the plantar flexion of all the toes now this babinski sign it is positive if there is lesion of the corticospinal tract that is the upper motor neuron region if the corticospinal tracts are damaged above the motor decussation there will be contralateral hemiplegia with positive babinski sign and if the tracts these are damaged below the motor decussation that will lead to the ipsilateral hemiplegia with positive babinski sign so the babinski sign is positive in case of the corticospinal tract damage normally this babinski sign is seen in children up to the age of 2 years because of the unmyelination of the corticospinal tracts moving on to the condition that is aneurysis bed waiting in case of infancy initially as the cortical control the corticospinal tract these are not myelinated the bladder is under the sacral 
control of the sacral menstruation center that is the S2, S3 and S4. Now the bladder it is emptied reflexly as it feeds by that of the spinal menstruation center. As it gets filled, it empties reflexly. What happens here? The stretch receptors in the bladder wall they are stimulated as the bladder feels. Afferents goes to the S2, S3, S4 level and the efferent impulses they pass through the bladder. Now here there is contraction of the retrusor muscle occurs and in turn there is relaxation of the internal and the external urethral sphincter. Consequently the bladder is emptied and this occurs reflexly every one to four hours. Now in grown up children, as the corticospinal tracts, they get myelinated, it will go under control of the paracentral lobule and the control over the Picturation according to the appropriate condition it will occur. So if the myelination is delayed of the corticospinal tract, that will be the worry of the parents. The classical example of the upper motor neuron paralysis is hemiplegia. Now what is hemiplegia? It implies paralysis of one side of the body. Here you can see in the figure, paralysis of one side of the body. Now this is because of the cortical capsular or the midbrain pons medulla legions. Cortical is in the motor cortex. The capsula will be in the internal capsule. Then the if cross cerebri of the midbrain these are involved, the basilar part of the pons is involved, and because of the involvement of the pyramids of the medulla. So it is most commonly it occurs because of the lesion of the internal capsule, and this is associated with that of the hemianesthesia due to sensory thalamocortical fibers. The alternating hemiplegia, this is a typical presentation of the brainstem lesion and this is characterized by paralysis of limb muscles on the contralateral side and paralysis of muscles of the eye, face and the tongue on the same side of the lesion. Now this is because of the concomitant involvement of corticospinal and the motor nuclei of the cranial nerve. Paraplegia the term it denotes the paralysis of both lower limbs as you can see in the figure. Now that occurs because of the lesions involving that of the motor cortex because of the thrombosis of superior sagittal sinus, because of anterior spinal artery thrombosis, then poliomyelitis, neoplastic lesions of the caudite spina, then extramedullary tumors and the peripheral nerve lesions like the leprosy, rabies, polyneuropathy, diabetes that will lead to the paraplegia as well the muscular dystrophy it also leads to the paraplegia. Now let's see how the motor activity of the body it occurs. Now the idea for the motor activity it comes to where from the various parts of the brain it comes to the prefrontal cortex now this prefrontal cortex it decides accordingly what will be the desired goal now the impulses from this prefrontal cortex along with that of the emotions from the limbic region and the memory component from that of the inferior temporal cortex it goes to the association cortex now this association areas 
the project to the pre-motor and the motor cortex for the intended activity. The pre-motor and the motor areas, they also activate the basal nuclei loop and the cerebellar loop for the fine coordination by sending information to these areas. Now basal nuclei for the posture control and cerebellum for the coordination. Now from the premotor and the motor cortex, the movement is executed through that of the corticospinal and the corticonuclear fibers through that of the lower motor neurons. Now from this muscles, the proprioception is sent to that of the spinal cord through the spinocerebellar and the cutocerebellar tracts. And the cerebellum, it receives the feedback of it. And in turn, the cerebellum, it gives feedback to the cerebrum. If there is discrepancy occurs in the intention of movement and the performance, then the inferior olivary nucleus, it comes into play. The cortico-olivary coming from the cortex and the spino-olivary pathways, these are projected to that of the inferior olivary nuclear complex. The climbing fibers from the cerebellum, olivocerebella, they send a large spikes to that of the Purkinje cell and they induce the modification. Now there is lot of correction occur at the level of the cerebellum and the rectification is sent to that of the premotor and the motor cortex. So as you know the cerebellum large inhibitory cells are lying here in the cerebellum. So inhibition, inhibition and inhibition. Rectification occurs here and it is sent to that of the premotor and the motor cortex. So this is execution of the simple motor activity. So to do the simple activity you have to execute around 15 complex circuits. So just to summarize, we had seen the pyramidal system, the corticospinal and the corticonuclear fibers. While in case of extra pyramidal system, we had seen the vestibulospinal, reticulospinal, fibrospinal and olivospinal and the tectospinal fibers. And the simple circuit for that of the voluntary motor activity. These are references for today's lecture. Thank you.